Good morning, Barnard. I'm Rona Wilk, class of 1991 and the reunion committee chair. And it is so good to have you all here for our first live session of the day, a celebration of 25 years of reacting to the past, the innovative role-playing pedagogy created by Professor Mark Carnes right here at Barnard. And I think this is a moment when the skills and lessons of the program are relevant and needed more than ever. And it seems appropriate that it, it takes us directly into what history can teach us about how others coped and debated and challenged each other in, in turbulent and, and unsettled times. Uh, before we go any further, just a note for all of our participants and attendees. Uh, this online event enables an attendee to participate through a personal device's microphone and or camera. An attendee may elect not to participate through use of a microphone or camera. The election of an attendee to use a microphone and or camera constitutes a release and waiver of rights in the capture of the attendee's image, likeness and or voice for the exclusive use by Barnard College. And now it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our very special guest today, Mark Carnes, Professor of History, and Judith Shapiro, President Emerita and Professor of Anthropology. So Mark Carnes joined the Barnard faculty in 1982 and his courses include the United States, 1940 to 1975, and several courses featuring the reacting to the past pedagogy which he pioneered in 1996 with the class, the Milestone class of 2000. Uh, some members of that class are here with us today as well. We hope to hear from them. Uh, his academic specialty is modern American history, although I took his amazing history of the Gilded Age course, so I'm just saying, uh, and also of course, pedagogy. He served as general co-editor with John Garrity of the 24 volume American National Biography and is executive director of the Reacting Consortium which directs the Reacting to the Past pedagogical initiative now used at over 500 colleges and universities around the globe. His most recent book is Minds on Fire, How Role Immersion Games Transform College. And I would also just like to add that Professor Carnes was one of my best and most innovative professors well before Reacting to the Past. So it was no surprise when he emerged with this incredible experiment. Judith R. Shapiro, served as president of Barnard from 1994 to 2008, and she has been a professor of anthropology at Barnard, the University of Chicago, and Bryn Mawr College, where she later became chair of the anthropology department, and then served as acting dean of Bryn Mawr from 1985 to 86, and provost from 1986 to 1994. She received her AB from Brandeis University, and her PhD in anthropology from Columbia University. Um, Professor Carnes and President Shapiro, thank you for being here. And just to note, there will be a Q&A session at the end and you can submit questions in writing uh, in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I am going to turn it over to Professor Mark Carnes. Rona, thank you so much for that. And uh, let me just begin, begin by saying as an historian, and you don't need to be an historian to make this point, but life, as we see, doesn't unfold as you expect. And this, the next hour, is an opportunity for me to explain how the unexpected occurred. I had no, I, I could not have imagined 25 years ago that I would be talking about this subject, but I'm delighted to do so. And when the uh, reunion uh, group asked me to speak, I said, I would love to speak particularly to the class of 2000 because this class was the transformative class of my professional life and uh, uh, many would say of uh, a whole initiative in pedagogical change in higher education. So this, this uh, is a moment I'm very excited about and I'd like to tell you his, the history of this uh, pedagogical change. So let's go to the first PowerPoint which sort of sets this up. This is all about particularly the class of 2000 as first year students in the fall of uh, 1996. Now let's go to the next slide. In a way, this story begins the previous year when um, 
I had been writing a series of professional successes. I had gotten tenure at Barnard and Columbia in 1989. I was chair of the history department. Then I did a book on history in the movies um, called Past Imperfect History According to the Movies. And this led completely unexpectedly to my 15 minutes of fame. I was on uh, the Jim Lear News Hour a couple of times and uh, uh, the Chronicle featured an article about me and I was really feeling like I was very special. But something bothered me. So let's go to the next PowerPoint. And this is what bothered me. That it was December 1995, and I was walking across the, uh, the, the brick walkway to Millbank, dreading going to my first year seminar. And I was wondering, how can this be? I had great students. The subject of the seminar were the great texts of uh, uh, a civilization. And at long last, I was, I knew the material really well. So we had great students, great texts, um, a successful instructor, and we were bored. Now I asked, the, 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 I felt that the class was a failure and I asked all the students in that class to individually meet with me the following uh, January after the semester break to come into my office and chat. And one by one, they came in and chatted and I tried to figure out what was going, what went wrong. After the third student told me that that class had been their favorite, I said, how can that be? I was bored, you were bored, you could feel the boredom in the room. And one st student said, she looked up at the books on my shelf and she said, well, you know, that's true, but all classes are sort of boring. Yours was less boring than most. And that resonated with my experience as an undergraduate. And so I decided I'd try to do something. So the next screen. So I decided that I'd change my, my class, the next uh, first year seminar into a series of structured debates instead of just, and they would be nominally configured as games. And the first would just be, instead of talking about Plato's Republic, we'd have a trial Socrates. And instead of talking about uh, the Analects of Confucius, we would have a, a sort of debate set up in the Hanlin Academy, which is the sort of cabinet of, the, of a Ming emperor. And then we would have a, a debate about Anne Hutchinson. Um, the, the, and, and that brings in the class of uh, 19 to uh, 2000 first year students. The, we did the first session, the, the trial of Socrates was nothing special. It was, I thought the debates were very effective. Um, but it wasn't anything special. It was certainly no pedagogical innovation. Then let's go to the next screen. Then we went to Ming China and that's where it begins. This is, uh, uh, I, is, is, is Pervy here today? Is she, you know, she's gonna try to make it. She has a, a toddler, but we'll find out later. In fact, I, I, I will hope that, uh, I know that there are some students from this class who are here today and I'd like you all to give your thoughts on this, on this experience just for the record. But uh, Pervy was the emperor in this debate, and Fizza was the uh, prime minister, the first grand secretary. And we had the first debate, and it was all about, about a succession crisis, but it's also about, chiefly about the Analects of Confucius. And I thought it was a good debate, but at the end of the debate, Fizza and Pervy came up after me to, afterwards and said, this isn't what it would have been like in Ming China. They're cracking jokes. They wouldn't have cracked jokes. The, emperor could have put them these uh, advisors to death. And I said, well, if you want, you could use more of the Ming rituals and, and, and uh, 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 you can do whatever you want to uh, uh, make them show deference uh, according to Ming rituals. So just make sure it accords with, ring, with Ming traditions. I didn't think any more about it. The weekend came. The next session uh, of the class was to begin and Pervy and Fizza weren't there. Then Fizza walked into the room as the prime minister and said that 
there were rules that we would have to follow, that everyone would have to sit straight, no one could speak, there could be no laughter, no one could look at the emperor, um, and there could be no side conversations, that if anyone violated those rules, they would be exiled. And because their grade depended on class participation, their grade would suffer. It is, I don't know if Diana is here. Um, I think she is. I, I'm here, yes. Okay. I just cackled out loud. <laughs> okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, what, what you said uh, tw 24 years ago was, she can't do that. And everybody looked at me and I was, I was flabbergasted. I didn't give them permission to, and I said, well, well, of course the, the emperor can do that. The emperor has life and death control over everyone in the realm. So then Kirby comes in, they have to stand and bow um, and sit straight. Then the debate begins and someone cracks a joke. It was a good joke. Fizza started to laugh and then she caught herself and she said, any more of that? You're out of the room, cut it out. And everyone looked at me. I didn't know what to do. So I just doodled, looked down and doodled. And then the debate continued. In the past, the students had looked to me for guidance or for approval. But when they saw that Pervy and Fizza were really in charge, they stopped looking at me so much. They stopped expecting me to interact and to intervene. And by the end of this first class, something very strange had happened. That when it was clear that students were running the class, students were speaking in an animated and powerful way that was completely different from any other class I had had. Um, the next class was even better when students, I moved my chair back from the, the, the table. And the next class, I moved my chair away from, and no one even noticed that I wasn't part of the class. This is the student's class. Um, I invited a colleague to come. And this is Rosalind Rosenberg to see this, a historian you, you may know. Uh, and then Fizza and Pervy were criticized for allowing barbarians to attend meetings of the uh, Grand Secretariat. At this point then, let's go to the next, the next uh, slide. I decided to invite uh, our new president, who is cool, clever, funny, and herself uh, just emanated innovation. I invited her to come to the next class. So I'm going to now turn it over to, to uh, Judith Shapiro. Do you remember Judith uh, coming to that class? I certainly do. Um, and uh, given Roz's experience, um, I, we were very careful about how I would be presented to the class. And so the class was told, I think, by Mark, that I was someone really of a very, very high and important family and background, but was suffering from amnesia. And so they let me in. And my main experience, it was a transporting class experience because the students were themselves transported culturally elsewhere. Uh, and, and they would stand when the emperor came in and they spoke not only in a lively way, but also seeking to adapt to the gravity of being in the Grand Secretariat. And so this was also a class where they were going to be working on both their speaking and I assume and know their writing and also where they were going to combine this lively class experience with reading great texts. So they were all going to be reading the Analects of Confucius. And that was really something as far as I was concerned. It was very exciting. And, and the, we then did the next game was set in uh, Puritan New England. And, and instead of being just debate, I tried to convert it to a, a real game where students could take charge um, as they had done in Ming China and really run it. Now, the problem is that the students didn't know the material. And it was beginning to occur to me that obviously students can't run a class if they don't know the material. But if you created a structure and the structure through rules and supporting material and, mm. and the like, and the role sheets themselves, if you created a structure that contained the material, the students by inhabiting that material would learn the material, but they'd also have the benefit of, 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 of leading, 
of speaking, of forming teams, of solving problems together. Um, at this point, I had a chat with Judith, and I said, you know, if we were to move in this direction, we can just leave it as it is now and have these debates. But if we were to make, move in this direction, we could have a class that would be very, very strange and bear no resemblance to what a normal college class looks like. And, and Judith said, you take this as far as you can and I will protect you. I don't know if you remember that, Judith, but I had tenure. I was a chair of the department. I didn't need protection, but it was a very important statement in, that if, in a psychological sense. It gave me license to essentially jump off my, I didn't do it initially, I didn't do it quickly. It took me years to decide to abandon my proper career path and become a pedagogical innovator, but that was in the back of my head. So let's go to the, the, the next slide. Um, uh, so this class was special. And at the end of the class, I got permission from Judith, I don't know how she did it, to continue the first year seminar for another semester. And I told the students in this class that we would continue it if they wanted. And uh, we then, uh, virtually every student in that first year seminar decided to continue the, con take the course again for another semester. And uh, we decided, I decided to do a game on the French Revolution. The second game would be on the, the, the Psychoanalytical Institute in, in uh, Europe in the early 20th century. And I asked for the third game, and and Fiza and uh, Pervy, whose families had experiences in, uh, had been to some extent traumatized by the partition of India, begged to do a game on that subject. I knew nothing about it, but in deference to their wishes, um, that became the last game of the semester. So, uh, wrote the French a draft of the French Revolution game over the break. Uh, quickly did one for, for, for Freud and Jung, and was working on the uh, indie game over the spring break. And my father had a stroke and he was taking care of my mother and my, my own life sort of was in chaos and I didn't have time to do the roll sheets for the India game. And I asked the students to each, uh, to, they were assigned roles, Nehru, Gandhi, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, Ali Jinn, and others to write their own roll sheets. And the game was absolutely wonderful. Um, and India then became a big part of my life and my professional life. The India game uh, uh, I, it is now, of course, has been published. Uh, Fizzy is not here today because she tragically died of cancer a few years ago. And the India game um, is now, this is the India game. It's now dedicated to uh, FISA for her work there. But what, what really is special is this entire class. Let's go to the next slide for being the pioneers, the guinea pigs uh, for this experience. So I'm gonna give you, I want you to see what a reacting class is like. But basically what it is, is these complex games that set in the past where students take on roles informed by classic texts. Uh, this is not of, of the 1996 class. It was a, uh, this was filmed a few years later. Maybe some of you are even here. Let's go just, this will give you a sense of what a reacting class is like, okay? So we're gonna go to a video uh, of another class doing the French Revolution game. Perfect. Right, you guys, Rousseau, yeah. is not, Rousseau is not a cookbook for or a government. No, but Rousseau is We're a creating idea. Okay, guys. I think there are people who want the actual society of Rousseau's general will, and there are those who want the best for France. Not, and that's what they call the general will. And I think that is what the problem lies in, is because, and I think um, um, clergyman or noble Machiva um, emailed us all about about who could define the general will. And I was just wondering if anyone had, because I think a lot of us have different perceptions <coughs> and different interpretations of what the general will is. And I, I think that I already have defined it. The general will is where we live in a society as equals, and we don't think about our own selfish motives. We think about what is best for our society, every, for France in general. Are you working towards the general will of France? Of course. 
Are you? Yeah. But we still don't agree, right? Yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. Just because we all are doing it, we still see things from very different angles. If we're actually all in this for the general will, then what we're worried about is how our children are going to be educated best. And if they're going to be educated best by the clergy, then we need to send them to the clergy. Everyone wants to provide a good health care system and a good education system to them. And I think what you're trying to say is that you want um, you want this, the, the state of France to be in charge of them and you want public schools. But right now, the people who know how to do this is the church. Okay. All right. I think um, perhaps she was, citizen that she was quoting Burke, shows just how undevoted that fact is to the revolution. Burke is like totally anti-revolutionary. Everything he says is undermining this revolution and what we are trying to do right now. By quoting him, you are showing just how much just how much anti-revolutionary okay. that action is. It is not anti-revolutionary in the sense that you think it is. Um, you think it's anti-revolutionary in the sense that you think that he's trying to tell us we should go back to the Anjan regime. And I don't think that's at all what he's trying to say. Okay. And I think that there are plenty of very applicable and logical and um, understandable ideas that he has there that I think all of us should incorporate into our lives. And who's to say that everything that Rousseau says is 100%. This is really important. I hate to um, break up the party here. However, we haven't talked about the royal sanction. We haven't, we haven't changed that or amended that or given a full veto or any of those things. However, as it stands now in the Constitution, the king, A, has a substantive veto, and B, has to sign things into law. I would like to direct your attention to both of the articles I've submitted, and I would ask that they... Um, point to the fact that I truly am invested in the future of France. Why these monarchs believe that our king supports them coming in here. You do not represent the majority of France, but a few select crazy Parisians. Crazy? Yes, I said crazy. 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 Can I finish my thought? Second of all, I'm disgusted, disgusted, disgusted by the Jacobins and the crowd for using this political, this situation, the danger that we're in, to manipulate the General Assembly. It's disgusting that you're taking the situation and playing a political opportunity. So I hereby make a motion to vote to declare war on Perugia and Austria. Okay, let's stop there. Um, at, can you hear me now? Okay, so as we see there, we, we have... Uh, uh, in the French Revolution game, there are the uh, the leaders of the sections of Paris who, uh, to some extent, uh, intervene. And as you saw, uh, Provost Liz Boylan and President Judah Shapiro were members of the rabble. And uh, uh, Judith uh, repeatedly visited reacting classes during her tenure as uh, president. Uh, Judith, do you remember your experience uh, as, a, as a member of the rabble of Paris? Yes, and, and I think it says something about the relationship between uh, the uh, faculty and the administration at Barnard, that a faculty member really thinks it's great to invite the president and provost to appear as part of, as part of the crowd out, uh, the rabble of Paris. <laughs> now, I had been on a brief leave, and Lafayette, whom you saw there briefly, um, had no idea who I was, but I got up at the podium, because I never keep quiet, and uh, denounced Lafayette, saying, Lafayette, you fired on the crowd. How could you have done that? Lafayette, meanwhile, is writing a letter. This is how uh, Mark would communicate with the students in the class during game time, clearly saying, who is that? And Mark is writing back saying, well, that's actually the president of the college. Whereupon Lafayette pulls herself or himself to his or her feet mm -hmm. and says, ah, a new voice from the crowd. Now, this showed me something in terms of the relationship between reacting and Barnard's uh, goal in producing strong women. I mean, that was really, this is a first year student. So that was wonderful. I should also just say in right. passing, someone's on the phone. Um, I should also just say in passing that um, Mark said something very interesting at one Who point. Who is this? He had already, um, do you, does everyone hear someone on a telephone call? No, okay, then I'll just continue. Just muted them. Yes. yes, I hear someone. Yeah, I think we just muted them. Okay, very so good. Everyone could just also remember, please mute yourselves. That would be great. Yeah. 
So Mark, who had already made important contributions, both as a scholar in his writing and as a public intellectual, felt that it would be a risk to his career to focus on his teaching. We certainly hope that those days are gone, but they're not gone easily. And to really have faculty members care and really be teacher scholars is something I keep focusing on uh, in my life these days. Uh, also, I should say that I've gone on, uh, after I retired from Barnard, to teach reacting myself. And I taught all of the early games, um, Athens, um, Anne Hutchinson, Confucius, and then the, um, the uh, French Revolution game. And it was a wonderful experience. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so after that year, I, I had a leave. And one of the things I did during my leave was apply for a grant because I was not a specialist in any of the subjects, the, the games that I had done uh, design for, but I wanted to bring a higher specialist to help punch up the games, fix them. And so we got a, I applied for a grant, got the grant, spent the next uh, three years, 98 to 2001, doing reacting classes, improving the games, working with more and more students uh, and more and more classes. And the, the grant officer said, but you've got to have dissemination. And I said, what the hell is that? And he said, well, you, you have a conference. You invite people and show them what you've done. So in the um, August of 2001, we held the, what, we, what is a conference where we invited 40 faculty and uh, members and administrators from other uh, schools in the uh, region to come. And instead of just having a conference, they played shortened games of the uh, shortened versions of the reacting games. At the end of the conference, the workshop, there is a, a cocktail reception and four uh, administrators and faculty members from other schools, from Smith College, from Trinity College, from uh, Queens College and Loris College said, we want to do reacting at our schools. We want to do it right away. This came as a surprise. Uh, I went, again, uh, Judith, and Liz had come to the reception and were mingling. And I said to them, these other schools want to do reacting too. Do we want to get in the business of spreading reacting around? And Judith said, uh, forgive my combination of English and French there. Yes, it will be our success d'estime. Do you remember that, Judith? I, I can't imagine you, you would. Well, I do remember it, and it is not as if uh, Barnard was rolling in money, but it did seem that sharing this, this pedagogical um, innovation and, and such powerful way of teaching was something we really wanted to do collegially with our uh, sibling institutions. And so that was what she said, we'll do it, but we won't make any money from it. Uh, and uh, the word, of, it began to spread by word of mouth. More faculty from other institutions found out ab about it. Can we go to the next slide? Um, the, you don't need to read this, but in 2004, Reacting and Barnard won the Theodore Hesburgh Award of the American Council on Education and TIA CREP as the nation's outstanding innovation in higher education. We went to, uh, I think that was, that was the award was in, in uh, Miami. And then it spread more and more rapidly. Let's go to the next, uh, the next. Uh, and every year where there would be a summer institute where faculty would learn the pedagogy by coming to Barnard, playing games, 200, 250 faculty administrators from uh, every year from other schools. Then there, there became a winter conference at the University of Georgia every year. Um, so, at present now, Reacting is found at over 500 colleges and universities around the world. Um, and we're gonna just give you a snippet. Uh, this is a, a, there are probably 60 or 70 videos like this prepared by other colleges and universities trumpeting their Reacting programs. This is a Reacting program from Georgia State University, Atlanta. This is a little video. I feel people took the games really seriously at times. The classmates got so, we got so passionate about the game. I think everyone was like, I'm not gonna be that much into it. And then we actually had to. 
more classes should be done like this. You you can you can play a character back then, and it, it gets you to more understand like what was actually happening. This class was definitely one of my favorite because we got to play those interactive games and actually, you know, produce our own thoughts on the subject. And I won't forget what I write. It just stuck with me. It wasn't like me having to memorize. Hey, if you were living in 1968 and you were part of that, hey, I'll praise to you. Cause definitely if you was like a yippie, like one of the protesters, cause they were just doing so much everything. I'll definitely remember how it felt to sort of gather support and speak with other people, communicate with them, and balance ideas so that both people can come out um, victorious and can get what they, they're looking for without compromising dignity. People who didn't realize they were competitive realized they were. Don't want to lose. <laughs> we would set up private group me sessions. Um, we we would have group me set out on our phones. We would DM each other and have these whole big conversations. We have the group me. We all we all meet up for coffee. It was yeah, yes, it was a bit of a challenge, but it was really fun to hear other people's opinions. The game was all the way played, even the times we weren't in the class. <laughs> Probably should add like hour fifteen. Get out. Get out of 15 seconds. You're saying that the class should have been longer? Yeah, the class should have been longer. So that's, that's fine. Let's go to the next slide then. Okay, so there's there now exists, back in 1996, the games were just uh, uh, probably 25 pages in total now. Each game consists of a game book that's most of them are published by Norton, which is 80,000 words. Then there are roll sheets that are downloaded because these are not public and they'll consist of another 100 to 200,000 words. And then an instructor's manual, which is also, so, so every game now is about a half million words of materials. There are 30 published games, most by W.W. W. Norton. Um, let's go to the next slide. The games that Norton doesn't publish are published by the Reacting Consortium Press through the University of North Carolina Press. We've got another probably eight games that are being published by them. We have 100 games in development by faculty, faculty throughout around the world. There's an editorial board that reviews the games. The games go through five levels of, de, uh, of development where they reach publication. So there's this elaborate structure to review games. Um, to make sure that they pass muster. Let's go to the next uh, slide. And Mark, just to, so just to note though, it's not just history anymore then. Uh, it's it's their history, well. art history, uh, all of the, reacting to the past consists of the past, but it is in all fields since in science, um, uh, art history, religion, political theory, uh, literature, uh, but, but it is not in the present. We, we do have it, to the past. Now let me just uh, say that in last May, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, which is for, for, for 40 or 50 years has been tracking history knowledge in the United States, and it's been seeing a substantial decline over this period. Last year they were so upset over the decline in history, not basic historical knowledge among the American people, they published a book reimagining American history, and they said, their only recommendation for improving history education at the college level was adoption of react, widespread adoption of reacting to the past. Um, next slide. Um, then the, to this past fall, the Chronicle of Higher Education did an article about the spread of reacting, noting that it was somewhat surprising that without major uh, uh, massive support, other than the Teagle Foundation, um, that uh, it had spread so broadly and become a significant force on 500 colleges and universities. I think then we can go to another slide. I, I think we can skip this. This is from the Chronicle article, which you can Google. Uh, also, a couple of years ago, I wrote 
a, a book on on lines and fire, in particular on pedagogical innovation. This was, in a way, I left my normal field as an historian and became interested in in all of these worlds in India, in in the French Revolution, and contributed, of course, to the the game books. But then this book was the biggest intellectual challenge of my life, and I think my most important contribution to scholarship by far. So this, the, the students back in the class of 2000 pulled me out of the world I was in and the track I was along and put me in a more interesting one, and I'm immensely grateful to them for that. Can you come back to, to I don't think there are any more, is there anything else there? Oh yes, this next, next screen. Um, as this program has developed, we formed the React, a corporation, a not-for-profit corporation. Judith Shapiro is a member of the board of directors of this, and the Racking Consortium is hosted by Barnard College. It uh, um, is developing the pedagogy. We are now have transitioned four or 500 faculty instantaneously from teaching face-to-face -face classes to online classes. Um, we're running, uh, right now, the Racking Consortium just finished a uh, online training session for faculty. But let me just finish by saying this, that um, what happened in that class in, in uh, the fall of 1996 certainly changed my life. I think you can make a case. It changed higher education. I hope we can, what I'd like to do next is hear from some of those students in that class. The Reacting Consortium would love to, to have your voices just on record, just to hear what you thought of that class, what your experiences were. At the end of the second semester of that class, that I don't know if any of you remember this, but you, we had a party and you gave me a present for every class, for every game. One of the presents you gave me was this toga. Can you, can you see this toga? There's a little toga for, to remind you of the Athens game and you signed it. Right there is Fizz's <laughs> name. Can you see it? Yeah. And see it. I think Ting Ting's here, right? Miriam, yeah. I've already, we've already heard from, and I think I heard yeah. Diana. Diana, are you there somewhere? So maybe if, if all of the students who were in that class uh, want to unmute themselves and- Yeah, and I'd love to, we'd love to hear from them and then we can just take questions and answers. But first, I'd love to say hi to the- I, I, I have to warn you, I have two toddlers running around, so they might interrupt me at any moment. That, all the better. Um, yeah, I, I, I am uh, quoted in the book as being the naysayer at the beginning of the game on the first day saying, uh, if this doesn't work, can we go back to a normal class? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I am- oh, sorry, can you just announce your name uh, who's speaking? Uh, I'm Diana Paquin Morell. Um, I was in the class, uh, both of those first classes in 1996. Um, and yes, I was a, uh, outspoken critic. I was also the one who said, uh, you know, are FISA and Pervy allowed to make uh, the rules? <laughs> um, and then, you know, it was definitely a transformative um, experience and part of my college experience at Barnard. Um, I what changed your mind about it? Um, I think it was engaging. It was thoughtful. It was well done. It bonded. Um, that it bonded me to my classmates. I became roommates with uh, Miriam, who was in the class. I, you know, 15 years later, I moved to Oakland and I got to live in the neighborhood with Fizza and we got to reconnect um, and become close friends again, that we just had these really strong, a really strong foundation of respect and friendship and also um, academic engagement and um, just camaraderie like, and, and just a, a, an engagement with the world and an ability to question the status quo. Like I just remember doing the, um, the French Revolution and the outcome was very different than what happened in history. And I remember uh, <laughs> Professor Carnes, you know, t pointing that out to us. And I think that was really important. Um, I'm an educator now. I, I teach fourth and fifth grade and I do a lot of um, project-based learning and a lot of, um, you know, um, pedagogy that is inspired by my experience. And it's good to see you. 
It's very good yeah. to see you. Miriam, I see you too. I'm here. Hello. Um, I think, um, you know, I can't speak to the academics in the way that Diana can, um, but the class was absolutely monumental. Um, and I learned a few things from it, I would say beyond the academics that to this day are really important, both, um, you know, in, in my professional life and my life as, you know, today in engaging in society that I think um, really were grounded in what we started in the class. So seeing that to Diana's point, you know, history changed in our class and, um, you know, seeing that being involved, educated and an active participant in society actually can change history or the trajectory of history was inspiring. Um, and then also I would just say that I learned a lot about leadership from Professor Carnes in that class, um, both through watching his style, you know, the importance of listening and, and mentoring and motivating individuals to succeed was tremendously powerful for me. And I take that lesson very seriously today. Um, and um, just the passion for doing what you do. Um, as a motivator for both your professional and your personal and, and engagement in society. That, um, you know, to take the time to listen, to engage, uh, to understand um, was, was tremendously powerful for me. Um, and the friendships, I mean, the, the, the memories of other friends that I had feeling jealous that I was in this class, um, feeling like, um, we were part of some secret society and we would have these conversations that <laughs> nobody understood or could engage in. Um, you know, I felt like it was a, it was special to be a part of, you know, even in that moment and, and just the memories that it brings back today are really overwhelming. Miriam, let me, before we go to Ting Ting, uh, let me just say, I am not a good listener. And one of the things that, that I, I, I'm accustomed to speaking. I like to control things. I like to dominate the classroom. But when I dominated the classroom, nobody else would speak and it would be boring as hell. Uh, what reacting forced me to do was shut up. And it was the hardest thing in the world, but the result was wonderful. So it was, it, what you say, it, it goes against my character and my nature. And, and even now I'm popping in when I wanted to actually hear Ting Ting <laughs> say something. So Ting Ting, good to see you too. Good to see everybody. This is amazing. Um, you know, I think following on what others have said, um, I have incredibly fond memories of the class, and I actually think back um, about that class quite a bit, um, both in my life and in my career. Um, history, before I went to Barnard, um, you know, I took history classes in, in high school and I thought about it. And history was this dry sort of dead subject, right? Things happened in the past and they stayed in the past and they are what they are. And the seminar brought it to life. And, you know, it made me realize history is made by people who made incremental small decisions in their every day. And each of those decisions has an impact. Each of those conversations could sway another person. And it, it was such a powerful um, lesson because in moving forward, I just, it made me think, well, we're making history every day. Everything that we do now is history. Every decision that we make now, every interaction that we ha have now affects how the present goes and how the future will go. And, and none of it, and it's all connected. And so you know, one of the things I, I thought, I, I've since become an attorney and, you know, I deal a lot with legal precedents and we look back on history and cases and how that affects our, our you know, life now and, and what rights we have now. And I have to think back about, you know, and, and this class made me think back about what were the debates, what were the, what were the considerations that these people took into to mind when they made those decisions? And it's, and it really makes it very personal for me. Um, and I, and I can't, you know, thank Professor Carnes enough for, for <laughs> taking the lead and, uh, you know, letting us run the classes. I think it was really 
one of the first times in, in my life I felt empowered to speak about a subject that I did not feel like I had any authority to speak about. And I think that's something that, you know, young students and, and even professionals sometimes have this um, struggle with, this imposter syndrome, right? That you don't have the knowledge and you don't have the authority to speak up. And this class sort of gave us permission to speak. Um, even though sometimes we were way off the mark, and, you know, things were not entirely, you know, on point. But you know, it, it, it was it was the 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 curiosity and the um, confidence to to learn, to make mistakes, to listen. As everyone said, listening was such a huge component of this class. Um, listening to each other, um, being willing to change our minds, you know, being willing to be swayed. And I think that's why you saw the the the, the result, the end result differ from what actually took place in history because you can change minds you can change people's opinions um so yeah that's nothing but great memories <laughs> it's good awfully good to see all you know do we have anyone else from that class here i know pervy wanted to come but she had a toddler who she thought would be too disruptive uh <laughs> if we don't there's no one else from that class here then let's just mm -hmm. open this up to questions do you um so if everybody, if anyone who has a question would like to uh, put it in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Um, I also just want to note, I've been seeing a lot of comments uh, of, of classes who, who did not get to take part in reacting, who's saying, you know, I wish that they had, we'd had this when I was a student. Um, and I absolutely agree. I, and uh, Daphne Phillipson also mentioned doing a sort of very, very small version of reacting at a reunion um, a number of years ago. And, and I did that too, which is why I really wanted to bring it back into reunion. I think it is just emblematic of, of the kind of education I think, you know, we all look to Barnard to, to get. Um, and, uh, and alumni relations, just if you're out there listening, I would not be unhappy if we decided to make reacting like a permanent part of reunion every let, year. Let, let, uh, let me go further. Let me go further. That Smith College a few years ago uh, had a, an alumni uh, trip to to England where they did the Henry the Eighth game uh, in England. Oh so, wow! Um, with, with well, uh, Ronnie uh, Levinson Burbank from the class of '75 mentioned that living history museums can do similar interactive uh, class tours and and whatnot. And also, um, so Sue asks, have any faculty members considered offering a reacting class virtually? So, so what happened uh, 10 weeks ago was at Barnard, including my class, my first year class, um, we had to change from face-to-face -face learning to online. So probably 400 reacting professors uh, using the reacting website for professors there's a faculty only website said, what the hell do we do now? So we changed over the course of a weekend from doing reacting face to face to online versions. And now the reacting consortium is running every week. We're running uh, training sessions for faculty and how to run different games online. We just finished one yesterday doing the Athens game uh, for 25 faculty from around the world. And we'll be doing uh, probably uh, 300 faculty this summer learning to do reacting online. The, the, Cancellation of our summer institute. Um, the, the consortium is funded by royalties from the game books, by member institutions, and by uh, registrations for the summer institute and the faculty training. We've lost about half of our revenue, so because of the uh, uh, pandemic. So, so we're it. We're we're we'll be financially challenged in the in the short run because of that. But, but now we are part of an online revolution. And what is interesting is that the people who've been doing reacting online say it works much, reacting works online much better than lectures because um, okay. the students are interacting, they're scheming outside of class. It's more fun. Excellent. Okay. Um, can I, can I, somebody I, else said, what would your suggestions be for adapting this for online use? So maybe just a couple of things that did you have to pivot to make it work? when yep. you pivoted online. The, the essence of reacting though is, that, is to motivate students and have competitive teams once they get the sense that they're competing and that they're making arguments, uh, that they will be 
connecting through Slack and back channels. Um, and students are pretty good at social media, better than the professors are. Um, so, so we have to teach the professors how do you do things like Slack and uh, uh, the like, what, whereas students know how to connect better themselves. But okay, basically, they'll be giving the same sort of speeches that we saw and same sort of debates that we saw before. I have no idea what Slack is, but I'm assuming it works. Um, Mark, could you, uh, so Paula um, says, Mark, could you talk a bit about how the students develop the background info they need for their roles and what those role sheets are that you mentioned? So the game book basically will set, will provide an historical essay, will provide various other readings and materials that will also set up the roles for the game. And those materials basically provide some of the context, the role sheets uh, for the India game. The original, you guys, you wrote your own role sheets. The governor's general role sheet now is 40 pages long. Okay, so it's 8,000 words for the governor general. So these are now substantial intellectual edifices that, that provide guidance as to what sort of papers you should be writing, how to research them, how to make your arguments, what your position is. And then there's an instructor's manual, which includes things like quizzes and other materials to help help students learn the material. But the idea is that you provide this structure of knowledge, then different devices to get students to inhabit it. Um, a big part of inhabiting is preparing their papers and their speeches and their, their documents uh, to advance their victory objectives. Um, how do, students, how do you determine grades? Most of, much of what they do is written. Uh, so they'll be writing papers and speeches and uh, uh, other documents, so you just grade them as before. Grading class participation is done variously. Um, I think that's the, what other questions are there? Uh, yeah, oh, I, sh I, don't, I don't know, should I be following the questions? Uh, so, so Monica uh, Mercado from the class of 01, uh, wants to know uh, if you could talk a little more about what it means to encourage pedagogical innovation as department chairs or administration. Uh, full disclosure, pretend you're faculty member asking. I'll, I'll have a very quick uh, uh, statement on that, and that is that faculty everywhere are very conservative. They are accustomed to teaching the way they've always taught, the way their sainted mentor taught them to, to teach, and um, particularly at uh, highly selective schools where everything's fine, there is a substantial resistance to doing anything differently. We find this at every institution that the biggest challenge we have is every institution's got a node our, of the, our 500 schools, have got a node of reacting faculty or enthusiastic and are saying, look, you're complaining that you're bored, you want to stop teaching, you begged to be given uh, leaves. We enjoy teaching, we're having a ball, try reacting out. Many faculty say, no, it's just idiotic. I don't need to visit a reacting class. I don't need to try it out. I don't need to come to workshop. I know it's just idiotic. This is not what higher education is. It's not play games. So the biggest challenge we have is that if you're really talking about innovation, faculty are deeply skeptical and very conservative. Um, am, I, am I too harsh, Judith? No, I think m my sister, the psychiatrist, likes to say a mind is a terrible thing to change. <laughs> and I think we, we certainly have found that. Uh, and I think we also have to figure out how we don't, you know, see scholarship and teaching uh, in the hierarchical relationship they're always in, but find that someone, notably Mark, is able to excel in both. And that some uh, proper reward for truly exceptional teaching, as well as a way of actually evaluating and assessing teaching, which we're not very much into either. Um, and haven't been historically is really important. Um, so we have probably time for one more question, which um, actually I'm going to ask and kind of build it on a question uh, or an observation from Tony Coffey, who observed that um, when she did the game at reunion, she thought that we were supposed to make it come out the way it did in history, but that doesn't seem to be the way it works in the class. Um, and in some ways, what I wanted to know is, how you sort of landed on the terminology of games, because I would think that that in, in the academy is, is going to kind of ruffle some feathers. So can yeah. you talk about playing the game and having a, a conclusion to a game that maybe is not historically, quote unquote, accurate? Yeah, so very, very quickly, 
this is a big debate in the reacting community and many reacting professors call them simulations. I'm trying to emphasize that it is a revolution and that you need to acknowledge this up front, that we want, we want students to engage in a deeper way and to sort of sneak your way in by saying it's a simulation doesn't give them the agency that we want by identifying this as play. That it's play, it's imaginative, it is taking you out of the normal class context and, and you want to win the game. And it's, that's why the games don't replicate history. They don't become reenactments because clever students presented with huge problems informed by big ideas can do wonderful things, can do extraordinary things, they can change history. And by, by defining this as games, it, it says this is a very different pedagogy, a very different experience and very different behaviors from what you would have in a regular classroom. So I'm one of those who insist, we want to emphasize that this is a game. Um, and anyone who's seen students play know that they work a hell of a lot harder at their impassioned play than they do at their uh, at at their their work. Um, I think that's that fabulous. I, I actually just want to. And Miriam added. I remember feeling like I wanted to beat history many times, and I like that. Can I suggest uh, if you'd so like to know? We all wish we could beat history. <laughs> let me finish a bit before. Right? Are there some of you who are young faculty? See out there. Uh, what I would suggest you do is Google reacting to the past. You'll find the the website at Barnard for reacting to the past. We're doing faculty training workshops on the virtual version of reacting all summer. Um, we're sold out for from June and July, but we'll be putting uh, more games up on, in August. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, the chances are there's a reacting cohort at your school um, that's looking for recruits. Uh, and, and this will be, as it was for me, not only a transformative experience, but a fun experience. And so while I'm fighting as is Judith against faculty who are very conservative, we're having a ball because they are not making arguments they're very enthusiastic about. They know that their lectures and their unstructured seminars are not much fun. They know that they're a reason why students drop out of college and why so few, so many students don't graduate. They know it's not, the learning research shows that our traditional pedagogies are not very effective. So they're arguing, let's hold on to this not very effective pedagogy. And we're saying, try it out. Just try it out. It, we've got research behind it. And, and so we're having fun. So what I'm saying to those of you who are, who are, who are faculty, give it a shot, uh, uh, try it out, and then you'll become part of the enterprise. Look, thank you all, particularly Diana and Ting Ting and Ruby and Miriam for joining us and and for changing my life and I think higher education. That's fantastic. And um, I think that is, uh, Judith, do you want to just say a closing remark? No, no. I just want to say how wonderful it is to be with the alumni. If only we could all be in the same room. One day we will be. But the Zoom thing isn't half bad. It, that is That is very true. And if you can stand uh, another Zoom later on today, and you're interested in more history, uh, I would like to invite you all to join us at this afternoon's event at 5 p.m. for Barnard History, when myself and the college archivist, Martha Tenney, talk about preserving Barnard history and how Barnard students have preserved their Barnard experiences, including taking reacting to the past, uh, and, and how that all, that all works. Um, I want to thank Mark Carnes, Judith Shapiro, uh, the amazing members of the class of 2000. Congratulations on your milestone reunion, and thank you for joining us. And uh, enjoy the rest of reunion. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you.